So good evening, everyone. We're waiting for one other planning board member to join us, but she should be here soon. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our uh, Northampton planning board meeting of August 25th, 2022. As you've seen, this meeting is being recorded. Um, I'd like to start out first, before we go to public comment, just to congratulate our, our staff person, Carolyn Miss on her appointment as the director director of planning and sustainability for the city of Northampton. Um, I think I speak for all the board, Carolyn. Yeah, it's been great working with you and we look forward to your continued leadership and vision over the next, how many years you decide to stay with the city. <laughs> so thanks for throwing your hat into the ring. I know uh, you're gonna be doing a couple of jobs for a little while till you find another Carolyn to, do some of this work, and uh, but we really appreciate it. Um, we'll try to be Thanks, as George. efficient. We'll try to be as efficient as we can to make your life easier. <laughs> so congratulations again, and thanks for serving us. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Nice welcome. <laughs> so um, we usually start our meetings with a, a period of public comment for anyone who's come to the meeting who'd like to say something to the planning board that is not related to the items on our agenda. And the items on our agenda are a new two family homes, a new two one fa single family homes up on Ryan Road, addition of antennas on St. John's Church on Elm Street, and a large community project up on Laurel Street. So would anyone like to speak to other items with the planning board? I don't see any hands. All right. Okay, dope. So we'll move right into our first item. Um, and hopefully, David, I'll text David in just a minute to see where he's at. Um, so we'll open up a site plan for a new, it says a new two family by New Way Homes, but I think it's two single family homes for New Way Homes at 596 Ryan Road, Florence, Map ID. 29-111. Hey, uh, George and Carolyn, I don't see Sam here anymore. Do we still have a quorum with four of us? Uh, you do have a quorum and here's David. Okay, okay great. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, with four for site plan, yes. Um, you need five for special permit. And Sam is back. So again, related to the, hello, David, related to the application for homes on 596 Ryan Road, um, it's a presentation by the applicant. Yeah, good evening. My name is John Hansel, New Way Homes, uh, East Long Meadow. I purchased 596 Ryan's Road, um, and I'd like to build two new houses under the new zoning rules. Uh, back around 1995, I believe it was, a house was there and it burnt down. So the place has been empty for about 27 years. And there'll be two houses with one shared driveway. Um, the pre-existing driveway is still there. That will be taken up and removed. Um, and like I said, it would be under with one shared driveway. So it's just going to have one curb cut instead of having two or anything like that. Uh, the homes will be... Will be all electric under the new zoning rules and regulations for when you go for this permit. And uh, so to meet 2030 requirements, city of Northampton. I've talked to the butters about the trees, and for once, um, they're happy. Uh, they want some extra trees cut down. So, anyways, and uh, I did see at the last hour some reviews from DPW. Uh, it'd be nice if we saw it a couple of days ahead of time, then we could try to correct everything, but it will be corrected before anything starts, any work or anything like that. Uh, it's really, it's, it's that in a nutshell. I don't know if you have any questions I could answer or any concerns. Mr. Hanta, we heard also um, during the day that the, uh, DPW had a request about the sidewalk on Ryan Road. Are you aware of that request? Like I said, I saw the request and anything that needs to be addressed, 
I don't, I didn't see how far they wanted though. I don't know if they wanted the whole frontage or how, what they did were looking for. That's the only thing I didn't see. All right. I can it. clarify that if you need to. If you would, please. Uh, the, the sidewalk is um, pretty deteriorated from a little bit east of the existing driveway all the way to the westerly property boundary. So their recommendation would be, and it's consistent with the site plan approval process that to um, reconstruct uh, the sidewalk in kind um, from that westerly lot boundary. So I have the screen up from this point here um, to just beyond where uh, Mr. Hansel's proposing the driveway curb cut uh, for the new access. So it would just be that section. The rest of the sidewalk is in good condition, but it's just this part that's in really poor condition. I have no problem with that whatsoever, Ms. Mish. And just to clarify, Mr. Hansel, you're going to take out the curb, the existing curb cut, right? Correct. That'll become grass. Correct. Okay. And we're going to try to utilize the existing water and sewer if possible from the previous house, if we can. Um, I think it's also been recommended, Mr. Hansel, because it's an additional second house. Um, there's some traffic mitigation involved for, and we're asking for a one-time payment in lieu of mitigation on that. Yes, I expected that. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I'm sure there's some, and there's also tree, uh, some tree funds also. Right. Yeah. And uh, I was up there today. I really appreciate the tree report that the arborist did. And the noting of all the trees, it was very complete um, and very handy in that way to identify trees and see them on the, the schedule and also in the arborist report. That was great. So thanks for thought, doing that. I thought I did an excellent job. Yep. Um, anything you can tell us about the lighting of these homes? It's just going to be standard lighting. There's not going to be anything uh, abnormal or anything different. Um, lights in there by cold, you have to have lights by the doors. Uh, so it's not going to be anything that's going to be lit up whatsoever for parking or anything like that. Just what the codes require. All right. Any other questions from the board before we turn it over to the public? Um, these Are these houses going to be mirror images of each other? Yes, they will be mirrored image. And then the, the decks of them are... Uh, away from the garage side, is Correct. that right? Yes. The decks off the back? Yes. I was just curious with the kind of the grading and, and where, you're sh where you're showing the limit of work in the back, is there room to fit the deck on, I guess the westerly house? Yes, there is. Okay. Any other questions from the board this time? So why don't we open it up then? Is there any pro anyone from the public who'd like to speak related to this application? Well, this is pretty straightforward. Um, okay, well, back to the board then. Um, I think there are four conditions that Carolyn laid out for us on the staff report. One related to uh, that the applicant shall install straw wattles as shown on the plane on the plan prior to the issuance of a building permit and prior to the issuance of certificate of occupancy, applicants shall make a one-time payment in lieu of mitigation for the one additional unit on the parcel. And prior to issuing the certificate of occupancy, the applicant shall show completion of tree replacement um, through either planning or combination of planning and payment in lieu to the city. And the fourth one would be the uh, replacement or installation of uh, new sidewalk from the easterly boundary to 
Should we just go all the way to the whole frontage uh, while he's at it? Or because uh, it's a savings of about, I want to say, 100 feet, perhaps. I mean, it's in good shape. What's the, what, what are we what are we getting out of that? I, I imagine the, the material will just be bituminous as it is now, correct? We don't need that. Right. That's what DPW is recommending because it, that's what it all is in that area. Um, I would just note as well that DPW had a recommendation in their comments about, um, can, uh, and it's their standard, they've been starting to put this in all application uh, reviews for applications that the applicant consider a, um, an erosion control um, plan uh, for the property. However, if you noticed on the plan, there's a work limit line as part of the tree protection area that consists of straw wattle. So that will be effectively the erosion control. Um, so I, I don't know that you would need to put that as a condition um, on the application. And it's a relatively flat site. So I don't think you need armored, you know, um, silt fence or anything. Yeah. That just seems like a bunch of extra. Sorry, Sam, I, I didn't get all of that. I, I just, it seemed like we don't need to add that to. I mean, it's, a, it's a flat site, it's really pretty straightforward. Well, because they are already having said that they're going to do those straw waddles along the, most of the work line. So, yeah, yeah, okay, no. Um, Mr. Handel, did you have an opportunity to, to talk to the abutters? Any of the neighbors before the submission of the application? Yes, I talked to the butters on the left and the right. It mostly went over the trees where they were, like I said, very happy that trees are being cut down and they're actually asking for me to cut down more trees. All right, thanks. Any other questions from board members? <coughs> So we, perhaps there's time to make a motion to close the public hearing. Uh, nobody's here to speak for or against the application. I move to close public comment. Second. Second. All right, we'll give it to Melissa this time. Motion's been made and seconded to close the public comment. Any discussion? All right, because we're on Zoom, we'll go to a voice vote. Um, all those, uh, Melissa, how do you feel? Yes. And Chris? Yes. David? Yep. Sam? Yep. And Jenna? Yes. And the chair votes yes also. So public comment is closed. We can't talk to the applicant. Um, any other discussion among board members? We're clear about the board conditions. <laughs> It seems we're just doing forward. the sidewalk from the new driveway to the westerly side. Correct. Okay. And the payment in lieu of traffic mitigation and tree the tree replacement calculations uh, and um, the straw waddles, the waddles. Well, that's on the plan already. So okay. I think that would, um, uh, oh yeah, um, right. So that, that, that sh you're right. I did recommend that they, that be, make sure that that's done before the, a building permit is pulled. Correct. So if that makes sense. Great. Then is there a motion? I move we uh, approve the site plan for two new family uh, homes by New Way Homes at 596 Ryan Road with the conditions so specified. The agenda really tripped me up there, but you all know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs>
And a second. A second. All right, thanks. Motion made by Dana, seconded by Sam. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, we'll go to a voice vote. Um, Melissa again? Yes. And Chris? Yes. And David? Yep. And Sam? Yep. And Jana? Yes. Okay, and the chair votes yes also. So thank you very much, Mr. Handel. Good luck with the project. Thank you, and I want to thank the board for its time. Okay, so we'll move on to our second item of business. Um, advertised for 7 p.m. Uh, site, uh, site plan for a modification to telecommunication antennas by T-Mobile Northeast. LLC at 48 Elm Street, Northampton, map ID 31D-101, uh, commonly known as St. John's Church near Smith College. Is there a presentation by the applicant? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick sound check if, uh, if you can all hear me okay. Great, thank you. Um, again, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, my name is Adam Braylard with a firm called Prince Lavelle Tai, and we represent the applicant T-Mobile Northeast uh, LLC uh, in connection with this um, application for site plan um, approval in front of the board. With me tonight is Ryan Ramos. Um, I just wanna make, yep, he's here, and Ryan is with uh, the applicant's radio frequency department in the event there are any questions uh, in that discipline. And also with us tonight is Sean uh, Mullen. Sean Mullen is, is with Transcend. Transcend is a site acquisition vendor for T-Mobile. So Sean's you know, um, worked directly with the church uh, in connection with the, um, the, modif the proposed modifications. Um, so we're here tonight, um, as I said, for site plan review, site plan approval, uh, pursuant to section 35009B. Uh, um, and the table of uses uh, in the city's code. Um, T-Mobile has an existing facility there and what we're proposing to do is modify that um, uh, located, it's on the church uh, at uh, 48 Elm Street. The, um, the, the applicant T-Mobile has been on site for about 15 years pursuant to a special permit, uh, sorry, site plan approval back in 2007 from this board, as well as a certificate of appropriateness from the historic commission back in 2007 as well. Um, we obtained, we filed not only the site plan, but also a request for certificate of appropriateness from the um, historic commission um, as well, and obtained that at the beginning of the month um, from the from the commission that we're in front of them on the, um, on the 8th or 9th of, uh, of, of August, I think it was the 8th, um, and, and received that certificate recently. Um, so we're in front of the board for, for site plan. So the proposal is the easiest way to explain it is to, is to tell you what's there and tell you how what we're gonna do to change it or to modify it. So there's three sectors on the um, bell tower of the uh, church, three sectors of one antenna each. And what we're proposing to do is replace those antennas with um, like kind or similar antennas, newer antennas, and then also add an antenna per sector. So it'll go from three total antennas to uh, six total uh, panel antennas. We're also gonna add remote radio units, which are one by one kind of boxes, but those will be within, you know, at the top of the um, uh, the bell tower, but behind the, the, um, the railing. So those will be out of view. Uh, and then we're also going to um, add some um, radio equipment within T-Mobile's uh, radio room or uh, equipment room, which is inside of the church. So that those changes will be out of view as well. So any changes that we make that are that are visible, um, those antennas will be painted to match the um, the exterior of the uh, of the bell tower. So given the Given that design, we believe that we conform to the requirements set forth 
in the code as well as uh, you know in the code in connection with wireless communications as well as site plan approval criteria thank you um mr Bellard, do you have a uh, a cut sheet that shows us in any kind of close shot of what the the new antennas will look like on the bell tower yeah we we filed the uh not only the plans but also a set of photo simulations uh as part of the application package um at tab four i can caroline i can share my screen or however whatever yeah yeah i i made you co-host so you could share your screen and show the uh board the plan Oh boy, so you're gonna really make me share my screen. Okay, hold on. You're the tech company. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can do that. Okay. Is that is that visible? That's good. Okay, so so let me back up. Okay, so this is this is tab for the application package. Um, and so this is the photo simulation company that did the photo sims back in May 25th, prior, and, we, and we use these as part of the application package. So what these are is a series of three or four photos. It's existing, the first photo is existing, and then the next photo is proposed. And so what I'll do is I'll go through these. So this is the existing site or the existing um, photo of, of what's existing on site. So you can see one um, panel antenna is on the existing chimney that's next to the um, cupola of the bell tower. So that's existing. The proposal is to, and there's another one on the other side there, but it didn't show, but is to, um, is to take that and put it, and take that one antenna that's there, replace it with a new antenna, and add a second antenna and so those panel antennas we're actually using smaller smaller antennas than i think are there but we we want to be able to fit those antennas within the um the column length um that's next to the railing so um we're using small antennas to do that and those antennas would be painted to match um so this is this is one sector here two antennas this is a second sector here where we're gonna uh, add the or um, add antennas to to this area inside that uh, the area where there's kind of um, uh, a, a, a jog out here uh, below the antennas and, and one above that and so that's about a little over four four and a half feet so our antennas are about four feet uh, and we're gonna fit those in there and uh, and also paint these um, these antennas to match the color of the um, of the bell tower. Um, the next photo so is from the rear. These are existing, and if I'm going too fast, please just slow me down. But these are existing antennas um, on the uh, existing chimney that's next to the um, cupola of the of the uh, bell tower. And the proposal would be to add the antennas, take them off the chimney, and put them onto the um, Onto the uh, this area of the bell tower, paint those to uh, also paint those to match. I think these photos do these photo simulations do a pretty good job. As you can notice that they, they even show shadowing of, um, of what the antennas would look like. Too. You're not going to be completely in, uh, you know, invisible, but um, but certainly uh, we think they they conform the way we've designed this conform to the you know the existing characteristics of the uh, of the bell tower and the church in general, similar to what uh, what's existing now. Um, the next shot is, I think this is more from the main road. Um, you can see an antenna that is hanging off the edge of the um, um, uh, the, the smokestack here. And those would be, that antenna would be replaced and, and placed down lower here on the, uh, on the, um, on the sides of the, of the railing of the uh, bell tower. And I think. So I think that's that's it for the photo sims. Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. Sure. Sure. Um, 
board members, any uh, questions before we go out to the public? All right, um, why don't we open this up to the public then at this point, if anyone would like to speak related to the uh, application, please raise your hand or uh, either electronically under your reactions menu button or visually so we can see it. All right, not seeing anyone at this point. We'll turn it back to the board. I know that uh, I understand that the FCC regulations don't allow us too, too much leeway in uh, modifying the plans as presented or changing them. So at least to my view, that appeared to be fairly innocuous. I was by the church today and I could, took me a while to look up at the top tower to see the existing ones. And I imagine the, uh, the one, the new ones along the railing will be unobtrusive also. Um, okay, that's good. Geez, we're moving along tonight. Um, last chance for anyone from the public? Anyone from Smith College or St. John's? Nope. All right. Well then, is there a motion to uh, close the public hearing? Move to close the public comment. Thanks, Sam. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All right, here and none, we'll go to a voice vote. And Chris, can we start with you this time? Yes. All right, and Melissa? Yes. And David? Yep. And Jana? Yes. And Sam? Yes. All right, the chair votes yes also, so the public comment period is closed. We can't talk to the applicant or anybody in the public at this point. Um, Okay, I don't think we have talked about any conditions regarding the implementation of this. So it's pretty clear cut. Any discussion at all? All righty, is there a motion to be made? I move to approve the, um, uh, the antennas on, what is this? I'm sorry, let me pull up, pull up to it. Does someone have the address on them? 48 Elm Street. 48 Elm Street. All right, by the applicant T-Mobile Northeast. Yes. Uh, is there a second? I'll second. Thanks, Melissa. All right, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, we'll go to a voice vote. Uh, Chris, we'll start with you again. Yes. All right, Melissa. Yes. David. Yes. And Jana. Yes. And Sam. Yes. All right, and the uh, chair votes yes also, uh, so that's unanimous. I'm sorry, Mr. Monte de Ramos and your other, we didn't get to hear from you folks tonight, but uh, this was pretty straightforward. Mr. Mullen, thanks for joining us. See you at the next. Uh, T-Mobile application. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. <laughs> really appreciate you guys do a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I guess I misjudged this one. <laughs> um, I don't think we have um, 20 minutes of minutes to discuss. Um, um, because the next hearing, I think, I think it's scheduled for 7.50. Ah, this is pretty rare. Let's call T-Mobile back and grill them a little bit. <laughs> um, so we could do the, we don't have any minutes. We don't have any A&Rs. A Didn't I send you a set of minutes? Yeah. Uh, July 28th? Yeah, you did. Okay. Well, I guess we'll look at those minutes um, for a minute and then we can. Uh... Okay, I'm trying to get that to stop. 
And then we can take a break for a little bit, I guess, right? Because we really can't open the public hearing until the posted time. Correct. All right. Yep. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes from July 28th? I move to approve the minutes. Second. Thanks, Sam. Seconded by David. All right. Any discussion on those minutes? We all had a chance to look at them. Great. Then we'll go to a voice vote. Melissa? There we go. Yes. Okay. Great. David? Yep. Chris? Yes. And Jana? Yes. And Sam? Okay, and George says yes, I'll tell. Minutes are approved. So in the, Carol, uh, if, if we're going to take a break, I have a quick question for Carolyn uh, re regarding sure. cell phone antennas. Do, does every cell phone antenna upgrade come to us? Uh, no, okay. most of them do not. Uh, this one was different because they originally had uh, gotten approval to be completely masked and not visible from Elm Street. And so the change was that they were, re and because of its location, they were relocating and adding antennas in a place that wasn't originally approved, you know, because it's on the face of a church, that was a little bit different. But for the most part, swapping out panels you will never see them. But if, if they put in like new antennas somewhere, does that come to us? Um, I, I don't so, want them to come to us. I want there to be more cell phone antennas, but I'm, I was like, I don't see enough of these and I'm worried because the cell phone coverage is so bad. <laughs> so new antennas that didn't exist before. So for you saw several right in a row along Elm Street and over by the middle school a year or so ago, maybe two years ago, where those were new panels proposed on existing poles. That comes in as a site plan. But if there's an existing um, approved location that includes a tower or if it's um, an existing pole of some sort or structure and the companies are just swapping out with new technology, and they already had the approval of putting the antennas in the same location, then that wouldn't come before the board. So that's hap that happens pretty regularly where it's just a building permit application. Okay. So yeah, so we don't have, um, so I don't have any a rs this time, surprisingly as well. <laughs> um, so, um, we would have to wait until 7.50 to open the next hearing because you can't open it before the advertised time. Okay. So that's, that's about 10 minutes. About 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I can also stop the recording and then we can restart it. Um, and then you guys can take a break. And I, it's really tough to discuss other administrative or anything related to applications at this point. So, um, yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. The only other thing that we would have is just, the, you know, the upcoming schedule, but, you know, that's not, just a few minutes. So I will. Um, Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the uh, planning board meeting and Rockhampton planning board meeting of August 25th, 2022. We had a little delay there until we reached our uh, appointed time to open up the next public hearing. Um, so, and uh, Carolyn, you've been able to empty the waiting room, check the waiting room again. All right. So be all set. So at this time, we'll open up a, uh, a 40-hour uh, uh, application um, submitted by Valley Community Development Corporation for 20 new residential units and two curb cuts at 23 Laurel Street. 
Northampton Map ID 38A-49. Um, and does the applicant have a presentation for us? Yes, the applicant has a pre presentation for you. Shall we kick off? I think we don't need a lot of background. It would be great. Yeah, let's okay. go for it. Okay. Uh, a few quick introductions. Uh, my name is Laura Baker. I'm the Real Estate Development Director for Valley Community Development. Um, there are a few team members that are also going to be presenting tonight. Uh, we have the architect, Tom Chalmers from Austin Design is with us and Rachel Loeffler and Lucy Conley, both from Berkshire Design Group. Um, I have a slideshow. Hopefully we can move through it quickly and leave time for uh, questions and comments. I know that we have some neighbors with us tonight. Can folks see this? No, not yet. No? No. All right, hang on. How about now? Yes. Great. So the property that we're going to be uh, talking about tonight is located at 23 Laurel Street. It is within a smart growth uh, overlay district. And the developer and sponsor of the development is uh, Valley Community. Uh, I think people are probably pretty familiar with where the site is located. Uh, it's basically this area in here. Um, it's right next to L3. It is close to the corner of Chapel Street and Laurel Street. A uh, quick overview, it's a 1.68 acre vacant parcel. There used to be a house on it that was part of the Northampton State Hospital property uh, that the city demolished several years ago. Uh, the parcel is currently owned by the city and is restricted for use as affordable housing. Uh, Valley holds an option to purchase the property. Uh, it is in the Village Hill Sustainable Growth Overlay District, Subdistrict C, also known as 40R within URB zone. Uh, what we are proposing is new construction of 20 townhouse style apartments that are grouped in seven buildings. And there will be two, between two and four apartments in each building. All of the apartments will be affordable restricted housing. Uh, we are planning and proposing eight one bedrooms, 10 two bedrooms and two three bedrooms. Uh, this is intended to be family housing a total of 20 apartments containing 34 bedrooms and a mix of in tenant incomes, uh, roughly half of the tenants at a very low income level and roughly half at a moderate income level. Uh, a quick look at the zoning, this uh, overlay district has a lot of um, flexibility as you can see, not a lot of requirements that might be typical for other types of zoning areas. Um, it does have a density limit of 21 units per acre. And then over here, you could see the proposed uh, characteristics, um, as well as the fact that we're at about a little more than half of the density that is allowed for this particular uh, parcel. Uh, parking that's required in URB, one space per thousand square feet of living area. This development is just under 20,000 gross square feet. Um, we are providing 20 parking spaces, uh, plus an area that you'll see on the site plan that's set aside to add four future parking spaces if they should be needed. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, maximum building height uh, within this overlay district, it says generally buildings are a minimum of two stories. Uh, the proposed buildings are all two stories with an average height of 25 and a half feet. Uh, the zoning for this overlay district asks that we screen the mechanical systems from view. Uh, and we will point out how the dumpster area is fully enclosed uh, and the mechanicals are, are either located within units, within enclosed mechanical rooms or wall mounted with vegetative screening. These are some other uh, development features that we wanted to highlight. Uh, we believe that the scale and massing of the individual buildings is consistent with the neighborhood, which 
is primarily along Laurel Street single family and small multifamily uh, dwellings. Uh, none of the two buildings on this site that we're planning are identical, so we're really looking to create a variety of appearances in the buildings. Uh, per city requirement, this will be 100% electric utilities, no fossil fuels on site, and we are also going to maximize rooftop uh, PV panels to the extent feasible. Most of the apartments have universal access, 17 out of 20, which means that someone in a wheelchair can enter. Um, and be on the first floor of that apartment. And three of the apartments are fully handicapped accessible. All the walkways and outdoor common areas are handicapped accessible. We have walkways within the property that connect to the public sidewalks along Laurel Street, uh, covered bike storage, playground pavilion, some open space green areas are kind of outdoor amenities. Um, and we've reduced the paving and improved circulation through use of a one-way drive. Um, and that is then therefore <coughs> creating a two two curb cuts, which have already been installed uh, by the city as part of a um, grant that they got to improve infrastructure and sidewalks along Laurel Street. Uh, this is a typical look at the building height. Um, it's, it's a pretty standard uh, two-story building. Uh, the typical height, as I mentioned before, to the median roof line is 24 and a half feet. Uh, typical height to the top of the ridge is 20, almost 29 feet. Um, just for point of comparison, even though there's no maximum height in the overlay district, the maximum building height in URB is 35 feet. I'm going to turn over to Rachel, who's going to walk you through the layout of the site. Thanks, Laura. Sure. Um, so in organizing the site, can everybody hear me okay? Um, in, orga in organizing the site, uh, we wanted to keep this uh, keep in consideration the scale of the neighborhood and the way other other houses are fitting on the street. Um, so we took really care to think about the front of the buildings and how they line up with the front of Laurel Street, so that the area has a smaller presence. Um, Tom will have some renderings that will show you what the buildings look like later in the presentation. Um, within so we have we have three buildings with frontage on Laurel Street, and then the other four buildings are on the in the back of the property. Um, access to the site is a one way drive, 16 feet wide, um, going through through the project site. Um, in the interior, we've pulled the parking away um, into the interior of the site, so we have 20 spaces on site. Um, we heard some feedback from the neighbors early in the process, so some concern about parking. And so we have a parking reserve area, which initially would be planted with lawn grass. But if um, if there is an increased demand for parking, we have capacity to increase parking for additional four spaces. Um, on site, we've pulled the, the, the dumpster enclosure to the interior to minimize um, any, any nuisance to the neighbors. Um, and also to provide access for dumpster trucks. Um, on site, we were providing some site amenities, including a playground area, a pavilion, covered bike storage, mailbox area, um, and, and, and a stormwater feature and an open lawn area. Up the hill, we have, we're protecting an existing tree that's on the neighbor's property. And we envision maybe an area with a couple of Adirondack chairs and a, and a lawn Lawn, lawn path up, up that way. Um, and then the entire interior of the site is accessible. Um, and each unit has their own their own entry to their own, own unit. Um, and each unit has its own outdoor patio space. So instead of having a front yard, backyard experience, each unit's front patio becomes the front porch and, and, and their private space. And we'll talk about in the planting design how we create a sense of privacy and enclosure for those spaces. Is there anything else, Laura, you want to add to that? No. Okay. Oh well, actually, <laughs> well, yes. So I this is a, one um, image where you kind of can see a little bit of the massing of the neighboring properties by comparison with the properties that are uh, proposed. Just wanted to throw that out. This is an illustrative plan of the same plan, showing you the difference between what's paved and what's planted, and kind of 
how that might feel to be in the space. Um, and do we go to the next slide? Or, um, our planting plan, we really want to create a really homey residential feel to the space. Um, so each unit will have its own planting around those patio areas for a sense of enclosure. Um, around the perimeter of the site, we have larger shade trees and in the parking area, we have some larger shade trees, but we're also being mindful of solar access to the buildings. Um, so our palette is using um, a lot of mostly natives, um, sycamore and swamp white oak and red maple. Um, for shade and then understory trees like red dogwood, red bud, and service berry. Um, some of the shrubs are like witch hazel and ilex glabra and red osier. So a range of colors and textures um, that I think will really, really carve out different sizes, spaces, scale of spaces on the site. Um, we will be using, we're using 80% natives on the site, um, which is great for habitat. Um, and diversity, um, but we will be using a couple non-native shrubs, evergreen shrubs. Um, they're varieties of natives to help with screening. Those are those areas where we really are compacted in space and the neighbors want, you know, screening from, from the project. Okay. You ready, Rachel? Yeah. Um, so as part of the project, um, 306 caliber of healthy trees would be removed. Um, according to the Northampton tree ordinance, um, we are required to replace half that caliber. The project exceeds that requirement with 166 um, deciduous trees being planted. We, we have many more trees being planted in addition to that that are evergreen, but we only counted the deciduous trees for that. So I think we're going to turn it over to Lucy to walk us through the stormwater management plan, which I would just note has been a topic of some concern for folks, um, especially living down downslope of this site on Laurel Street. Okay, so um, the stormwater is designed uh, with a network of pipe conveyances throughout the site, which lead to two infiltration uh, detention areas on the south side. Uh, one open and that one, and then below it, a, a subsurface system. Um, so the northern part of the site and the eastern part are conveyed to the open area, to the open detention infiltration area. And the majority of the pavement and the buildings along Laurel, building six and seven, are conveyed to the subsurface area. So we're using these two uh, infiltration and detention facilities to lower the uh, peak flow runoff uh, from the site uh, to below what currently uh, leaves the site as far as runoff. Both of those uh, areas, detention infiltration areas, uh, have overflows which are pipe which have a piped connection to the storm uh, drain system within Laurel Street. Um, so they tie into a manhole, that existing manhole on Laurel Street, which is, in, which is on the site frontage. Um, so whereas in the existing condition, runoff from the site flows uh, onto Laurel Street and flows down Laurel Street, it's mostly captured at Grove Street in, by a catch basin. In the design system, the runoff is directly conveyed to the storm sewer system in Laurel. Uh, so there's a drainage manhole on site, uh, right right below the subsurface system. Yep, and um, the uh, the overflow from the open system and from the subsurface system connect are collected at that manhole and then connected to the city system. In addition uh, to to this, we have uh, planned for a curtain drain along the south border there um, to safeguard the four homes that are located south of the project. So this curtain drain should capture any excess groundwater that, that isn't already captured in the other systems. And that, um, that curtain drain is also connected to the same manhole 
which uh, then flows into the city's storm drain system. Thank you. We'll let Rachel talk a little bit about the planned lighting on the site. Again, we're really wanting to emphasize the residential homey aspect of the site. Um, so we're, we're going to be relying on um, lighting underneath the front porches of the buildings at the dumpster and at the pavilion, keeping the light levels really low on site. Um, our lighting designer did have a couple of fixtures that um, were bright underneath the canopies at the front and they're actively working with us to, to lower those even further um, to get things under the five foot candle maximum allowed on site. And we'll update you with that when, when that's available. Right. Um, unlike many developments, we're not looking at any tall pole lights. We're not looking at any special lighting for the parking area. It really is kind of a, a style of lighting that you'd see for a smaller residential development, really just lighting people's way into their homes. And then just a few lights at these two areas. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about our work uh, with the Laurel Street neighborhood. Um, we've had a lot of assistance um, from the ward councilor, Karen Foster. I think she's here with us tonight. Um, together with the city, we've organized a couple of uh, meetings like this on Zoom, pretty much. Uh, one in April of 2021, one in October of 2021, and the most recent one in June of 2022. Um, we've provided periodic updates to the ward councilor to share out to the larger neighborhood on the listserv that she maintains. Um, we've had, I have had in-person meetings with abutters who are on either side, immediate abutters on either side of this property. Um, and because of the concerns that were raised about kind of existing conditions with wet basements, um, downhill on Laurel Street, uh, the city was able to fund a stormwater analysis report um, that looked so specifically at the conditions for those four neighbors and ways to mitigate the existing problems that they've been having with stormwater. Um, I'm just going to run through a few of the concerns that we heard from neighbors. And again, I know there are folks here tonight, and they may also want to talk about concerns that they may have. Um, one is privacy. Uh, and so we've provided fencing and vegetative screening uh, for neighbors along the, the south and the north side. Um, there's a six foot cedar fence on one side. There's a proposed eight foot cedar fence on the other side requested by the abutter. Uh, one abutter, initially we have the playground close to one of our side abutters and the request was made to move it further away, which we did. We relocated the playground kind of more toward the interior. Uh, same with the pavilion was initially located kind of pretty close to a neighbor's property line and we kind of pulled it toward the interior. Um, this is probably one of the hottest topics we've discussed along with stormwater is just the number of units and density of the project. Um, we began our planning uh, sharing 24 units with neighbors. We did reduce back to 20 apartments. I think it's fair to say many people living on Laurel Street might think that's still too many for their neighborhood. Uh, insufficient parking, um, we, we have planned one space per unit, which does comply with zoning. Um, it also matches our experience as affordable housing providers that we don't see that level of use uh, in affordable housing. We see ratios closer to 0.5 uh, parking spaces per unit. So we're very comfortable at the 20 units that there's space for everyone who will live there along with any staff who might be coming or any visitors who might be coming. Um, but we also have a designated area that Rachel showed you on plan. If it turns out that there's a problem, there isn't enough parking, we do have capacity to add four additional spaces that are on site. Um, concern about where the dumpsters would be located. Would they be unattractive? Would there be smells? Um, we did relocate them toward the interior and uh, are providing a full uh, fence screening for those. Stormwater issues, um, the, the, the stormwater design that Lucy went over um, has redundancies in it. Um, it's using two different methods to capture stormwater. It's also using the city's own stormwater, existing stormwater system for, for a very heavy rain situation. 
and then we're doubling up with the drain, curtain drain uh, along the side property so that we can, we can make extra sure that we're not contributing in any way to some existing stormwater issues. Um, and the reason everything is flowing uh, toward the south of our site is, is topographical. That's the way the site is um, slopes and it is the existing pattern of the way that the water runs. Um, initially the buildings six and seven, which are the ones kind of fronting on Laurel Street, we had their patios toward the parking lot, toward the interior. After talking with neighbors, um, we were encouraged to reorient those so that the front of the building presents to Laurel Street so that it feels more integrated and is part of the neighborhood. Um, I'm gonna turn it to Tom to talk a little bit about floor plans and the design elements of the project. Tom? Yeah, hi, good evening. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so as Laura hinted at, we were trying to reach, um, a, create a variety of different buildings but to do that also in a way that was had some efficiency in terms of construction. And so we have basically a, a, a unit type that is a L-shaped courtyard um, unit where you enter off the courtyard and on the and this basic type is developed to either a one bedroom, a two bedroom or a three bedroom. The one bedroom obviously would have it, the one bedroom is, in the center here, this happens to be a accessible unit, which is a slightly different um, dimension in front. Um, but basically where the stairs would be, instead of stairs, there's, there's bedroom and bath, larger bath. The two bedroom units have a have all the ground floors living area and the stairs leading up to two bedrooms on the second floor. The three bedroom unit is the same configuration on the ground floor but has three bedrooms on the top floor, which I think you can see in the next slide. Yeah, I think the next slide has. Yeah, we'll go to um, it. Yeah, um, next slide has <clears throat> the second floors, which the one of the bedrooms overlaps um, the other. Uh, right, so this two bedroom is on the right and between them is the one bedroom level and on the left is the three bedroom. So these, this basic L shape is combined in many a number of different ways in seven buildings. So they're really this, I think there's only one or two buildings that are identical. Um, the plans is all the units are group one for under master's MAB visitable code. So the doorways are on the ground floor are all 36 inches. Um, People can get, a wheelchair can get in, turn around, move around the place and get out. The accessible unit has um, a larger bathroom with a roll-in shower um, and a slightly larger living area and bedroom. <clears throat> um, I think we, you wanna go to scroll down to? Yeah, I will they in have, a second. Okay. <laughs> um, they have oh so people can see yes good well idea. I, I would like to uh, Tom's not going to toot his own horn but I, I really like I would like to live in these units that's always my kind of standard for what we build um, I feel like having this large amount of glass here where you're connected to this nice open common area and a private courtyard is a really nice feature lots of windows in these buildings um, there's going to be washer and dryer available for people um, within their units, which people really like. Um, the two and three bedrooms have a half bath on the first floor and a full bath on the second floor. I just think these are going to feel like nice, open, light, airy places to live. And I love yep. the fact that everybody has a private outdoor space that's connected to an indoor space. So, uh, yep. Yeah, I was just going to say they have a strong front and back, which yeah, which is works well with the, the kind of courtyard uh, layout of the site, right? And it allows them to be pushed back towards the towards the edges a little bit. Yeah. Um, second floor, you know, the this this corner um, courtyard gave us an opportunity to really open up on the second floor. So there's a little overhang over the entrance, and gives a little study area and gives a large, kind of a nice large hallway, um, which is nice, especially in a three bedroom where you have a number of people moving around. Um, 
We will have solar panels. Um, mm -hmm. They're going to obviously be, this is just one situation. They're going to be different depending on what the orientation of the units are. Um, but we're going to try to max them out to be able to make up uh, balance on the electrical use for energy uh, as much as we can. So these are a couple of renderings. Now, these renderings is, <clears throat> is building six. And I have to say as a disclaimer that these are were made prior to um, flipping them around on the site. So while the building is the same, if you try to match it with the site, you'll get a headache because they're kind of mirrored and flipped at the same time. Um, but this is a, this is the courtyard that's an, an entrance to, to one of the, the two bedroom units. Um, and this is another this is another entrance to the other side unit. This side, right, what you're looking at here is the side that's gonna be facing the street. So um, on the left is one of the entrances and on the right is the other entrance. And the more, the straighter flusher facade that was on, that was formerly facing the street will now be facing back in the courtyard. And these are just a couple more uh, renderings of what they look like. Um, in terms of, <clears throat> we, we were gonna, yeah, so this is the, what's now, that was facing the street on the right there, and now this is facing back on the courtyard, same on the left. For finishes, we're, we're looking at hardy plank uh, siding, um, clabbered siding with uh, some accent shingles at gables and some horizontal banding. Um, and I think colors, you know, are certainly up in the air now, but probably some kind of grays or earth tones. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. So we are at your disposal for questions. Thank you very much. So planning board, before we uh, move into the public comment, are there any clarifying questions you might have? When the the uh, parking, I'm sorry, I'm having some internet issues. Um, but, that extra parking um, spaces, are you putting any money aside for the um, potential paving? We're not putting any specific money aside. It's an interesting idea. Um, we will have um, a number of reserves, including a capital reserve that are set up at the time that we built the property that I think could accommodate paving if it's needed. Um, certainly open to that idea. Um, we honestly don't think it's going to be necessary, but we wanted to show that we have the space for it. And we also wanted to do the stormwater calcs, assuming that it's paved, so that if we do go to pave it at a later time, we've already built in the stormwater capacity for it. Thank you. Uh, I'm assuming these units are all built on a slab. Correct. Um, what if, do you have any accommodations at all for storage of, uh, you know, household articles, large families, two, three children? Yep. How would that be handled? Yeah. So storage is limited. I mean, there's closet space. There's actually a pretty decent amount of closet space in this particular design. Um, for bikes and things like that, we are providing an outdoor covered bike storage area but that's, that's the extent of storage that we're providing. In, in terms of the mechanicals, you mentioned that in your presentation. Um, I guess many of these will have uh, heat pumps or multi or mini splits. Correct. And, and the outside units will be kind of tucked around the edge, especially on the units that face Laurel Street. Yeah. And not in the front. Uh, yeah, so- that's right. there, there are several, um, it's a variety. Some um, units, some buildings have enough space to grab for some interior mechanicals. Some have actual little sheds on the back side of them to house some mechanicals. And then I think we were talking about wall mounting, um, the, the things that have to be outside like the condensers. Is that right, Tom? Yeah, we have a, so we have a mechanical space for each unit, <coughs> um, for each building. Uh, which will be able to hold uh, domestic hot water, heat pump, 
heat pump hot water heaters and then uh, the condensers will be outside. And within the building, there will be the mini splits in the rooms and there will also be an ERV, ducted ERV system, which will be in the uh, ceiling cavity of the second floor, which will service the units. So in terms of what the public might see, um, the only thing that would be visible from the outside are condensers, and we would be putting those to the side or rear of the buildings, and there's a lot of landscaping that's provided to kind of tastefully um, locate those. Thank you. All right, no other big questions. George, I have plate. a question. Go ahead, Jen. Um, I got a little bit turned around with the, I think buildings six and seven that are shown on the renderings facing the road and then will be facing interior. Um, you described that the neighbors were concerned that it was felt from the street like they were looking at the backs of buildings and so you pivoted them. So yeah. I'm wondering if you can show again what it's going to look like from the interior of the courtyard and if you've thought or addressed at all what that's going to do to that interior feel on the site that now the other four buildings in the back are going to be looking at the back of a building. Um, so if you could just maybe show that rendering again and, and describe how you think it's going to feel uh, from the interior of the site. Yeah, I think also a good drawing would be to look at the rendered site plan a little bit too. Are you guys seeing this again? Yeah, okay. uh, let's go start at the rendered site. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So um, building seven actually has a, you know, there's, they're offset enough that I think it's, it's, uh, you know, it's not going to be, it's going to be not unlike the others. We also have, uh, we have windows in the back and we have a mechanical room in the back. So there is a door. Uh, it's not going to be a completely blank wall. And I think, okay, and if you want to go, I think we have a rendering. It's, the rendering is maybe a little bit old because we may have added some windows since then. Um, yeah. So I think this is this is basically the back here. Mm -hmm. So we have a mechanical room. We you know we can. I think this is showing an attempt to to make it a little more of a friendly door. Although that's the covering is not necessary. And there are it, it's not it's not a blank wall. There are windows. The kitchens look out there. Bathrooms look out there, and the stair hall looks out there. Yeah. So, and I would there's add, some activity. And the, oh, go ahead, Laura. And this gable, and this, <clears throat> there's an attempt to articulate the, the facade of this side, so it doesn't yep. read right. so much as a back of a building. Go ahead, yeah. Rachel. And that facade, um, I think the renderings really are trying to show the character of the building more so how it fits on the site. Um, yes. The site plan has a row of four service berry trees that they're like 25 feet high, white flowers in the spring, really lovely trees along the back. Um, so the landscaping for both of those buildings, the back side is not going to feel so much like a back. It's going to feel more like a, a shadow backdrop for the beautiful yeah. trees. And, and the, the other thing is that you approach, even though the, they're facing the street, the approach in the parking lot comes down from the from the back and side into the building, so that uh, there's, you know, there's traffic. There's, there's people are going to be moving across those spaces to get into their building. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit different than the backs of the buildings on the opposite side, where there really isn't any access back there. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yep. Could you just tell us a little bit about how the maintenance is handled of the storm, the, the plowing, the lawn maintenance, shrubberies, things of that nature? Sure. So um, at Valley, we, we have properties that we own now, rental properties in Northampton. Um, we do contract with a, a professional property management company, Housing Management Resources. Um, so they'll typically use third-party vendors for plowing. We'll have one plow truck do all of our properties. Um, they'll take care of the lawn care. It's a, it's a pretty well-oiled machine in terms of getting that basic maintenance uh, work done. Thank you. Yep. All righty. Well, why don't we open it up to public comment? Um, and I just want to say in advance, I appreciate all the proactive work you've done with the neighborhood. I know it hasn't been easy. 
for the for the neighbors. Um, but I appreciate that Valley's reached out to them on a number of times and you've been open for those discussions. That's great. So is there anyone willing to, uh, who would like to come forward and speak in re relation to the application? Please raise your hand by using your menu button or just wave it. All right, Donna Ray. And if you just state your address, Donna, for our records and minutes, that would be great. Donna, you're yeah. muted. Donna, you're there. Yes. We go. Okay. Um, this is Donna Ray, and I own the property at 39 and 37 Laurel. I live at 37. And I was just wondering what the timing associated with um, beginning this project where it actually becomes an active construction site is. I'm happy to speak to that. Hi, Donna. Hi. So, hi. So, our, do you mind if I respond? No, I Not think this question's okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I know it's improper, isn't it? <laughs> um, so if we we are going to put in an application, assuming we we end up with a zoning permit, uh, we would proceed to the kind of raising money stage of this project. And the soonest, if we are super super successful right away, the earliest we would break ground would be probably spring of 2024. Uh, but it could easily be a year later than that, spring of 2025. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And just in relation to questions from the public, we may not answer them all right away. We may group them together and the board and the applicant will respond as we kind of uh, batch them, okay? So we don't have the applicant speaking to every issue together. So we may kind of hold them towards the end and then deal with them all as a group. So let's go to um, Barbara Blumenthal. Um, I think Anthony had, had his hand up first, but I have a quick question. Is that okay? That's great, yeah. And it's, well, it's not so minor. The, um, because uh, the, the issue of uh, the lighting, um, so there's seven units and presumably each one of them is having a porch light and, um, I'm just, I know, I know that Northampton's trying to move, I hope, towards shielded lights so that the light really doesn't escape. Is that the type of light you're going to use here? Could we, Barbara, that's a great question. I think we'll come back to the lighting in general and talk about those, okay? Um, they did say that they're looking at the lighting design again with their consultant. And they'll probably be giving us a revised lighting plan before they proceed. But we'll we'll answer that before the end of the meeting. Oh, okay. Um, all right. Um, I think that's all I had for now. Thanks. Great. And now, uh, Anthony Pike. Hi, Anthony Peck, uh, 9 Laurel Street. Um, I live um, directly south. Um, I'm, I'm one of the four houses that's south of the site. Um, on Laurel Street. Um, I just wanted to thank uh, Karen Foster for organizing the meetings with uh, Valley CDC um, and also thank um, <clears throat> Laura and Rachel and Lucy for working hard to address the concerns rela related to the drainage issues. Um, so my question really is about the, uh, the solar, uh, which, uh, which is a new thing. So I'm just kind of curious about it because we have on the four houses that are south of the site, we have um, solar panels on all our houses. Um, and they're pretty large systems. For example, my house has 43 panels on it. Um, and I, I recall when they built, um, and my house was the second built on the street that with solar panels on it. And when they built the other two houses, I recall they had to upgrade the, um, the electrical system on the street. I don't know what that is exactly. And I'm wondering if a similar upgrade process might have to occur with um, solar panels, which I heartily endorse. I'm really pleased to hear that you're doing this, um, but I'm just wondering what the impacts might be on the on the electrical system here. Thanks. Thank you, Anthony. Great. Uh, Carmen Juno. Okay. 
Carmen, hmm. you seem to be muted, even though we don't see your icon as such. Can you hear me now? That's better, Carmen. <laughs> it's okay. Hold. No, I'm sorry, Carmen. We've lost you. Hold on a second. I'm going to make it better. Hold on. Okay. Oh my God. And you're you're welcome if you'd like to turn <laughs> off your this. Okay. Let's see. Can you hear me better now? Yes. You can, okay. So um, I wanna say a couple of things. Um, I'm, I'm the chair of the Housing Partnership. We are uh, an advisory body to the city regarding issues of affordable housing. Um, so we take a great interest in this project and all these projects. And so as you might expect, I give my full endorsement to this 22 unit affordable housing project. Um, are you still hearing me okay, George? Yes? Yes, Carmen, it's fine. You're coming in through well. Oh man, yeah, I'm having a lot of trouble. Anyway, so I mean, that's the main thing that I wanted to say and endorse. Um, I think we all have to ask ourselves where would Northampton be without any affordable housing? and. I think we would be in dire straits. I also want to reflect that um, <clears throat> this is probably only the second full housing um, 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 what do you call it when uh, kind of explanation that I've listened to and I don't know, it just really strikes me as strange that all of us who are mostly homeowners are scrutinizing, you know, to the point of where the bathrooms are, these affordable housing projects and where the lighting is, when if we were buying a home, no one, nobody would be scrutinizing us. And I feel very awkward listening to all of this detail about this affordable housing project, 22 unit affordable housing project um because it's affordable housing and if it were a regular housing project we probably wouldn't be scrutinizing it like this and i just want to <clears throat> emphasize how awkward i feel about that we're all white most of us are white we're all homeowners we're just you know we're looking at every single square foot of this and i I hope that we can all, you know, endorse this um, without a lot of further scrutiny, except for maybe safety issues like drainage. I just feel very awkward about it. I also want to add that I live at 73 Straw Ave. My backyard abuts Meadowbrook Apartments, 252 apartment building. And um, my neighbors have been great. and we wouldn't have the diversity in my neighborhood that we have without Meadowbrook. So I hope that everybody sees the value of this kind of housing project. Thanks, George. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. All right, um, Barbara, B. Carmen, you might wanna turn off your, mute yourself. Thank you. Hi. Um, Thanks, George. Just a, another really quick comment, and I apologize. I didn't give my address, 39 Chapel Street um, um, in Northampton. And um, the other thing I wanted to say, I want to address what Carmen said, but the other thing I wanted to say about the lighting, and I'm sorry if Carmen's uh, unhappy that we're addressing lighting, is that I'm hoping that this isn't lighting that just maybe automatically stays on all night or, you know, because most homeowners, 
you know, I've had to call my neighbors and say, you know, you're leaving this porch light on and it shines in my window. So it's a sort of thing that happens with individual homes, with apartment buildings. And it's just, but if it starts off as not being designed that way, it makes it easier. And I just want to address what Carmen said, because when anything was happening at Cole Morgan or Village Hill, which has a great variety of types of housing um, uh, for all different economic groups, um, uh, these sorts of things do get, they, they are a concern to the neighborhood, no matter who's moving into the housing. Um, and in part on Laurel Street, because this is and I'm sure the neighbors on Laurel can tell me more. This is if there's seven units, it's like having seven more houses and there may be only seven or eight houses on the street now. So it's doubling the population. So I think that as neighbors and I'm, you know, I'm within sight lines of, of Laurel Street and um, that we, um, because we're given this opportunity because it's not an individual bringing a house, um, it just allows us to sort of negotiate so that we can be better neighbors in terms of not um, adding to light, things like light pollution or drainage issues. Uh, when it's a development, it's these sorts of things are addressed by the planning board and it's just sort of a fact of life. And I, 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 I somewhat take offense at Carmen saying that she feels we're doing this only because this is affordable housing because I think, I think everybody in this neighborhood does support affordable housing in this neighborhood and we're probably gonna get more of it on Chapel Street further in the future. So it's not that we don't want this here. It's just, we wanna make it, you know, nobody likes change. So we're just trying to help it ease in so that the character of our neighborhoods don't change that much in terms of the amount of housing and the amount of light and the amount of water runoff. Thank you, Barbara. Thank, thank you for letting me yes. speak. Yes, no, no, and I'll reiterate that regardless of who the intended inhabitants are, the occupants of any uh, development of this size, the planning board's responsibility is to look at all of these different issues. Um, the, uh, the lighting, the, uh, the plantings, the traffic mitigation, the parking, um, we do that kind of blind, uh, regardless of who might move into a development anything more than three homes. All right, let's, I think we'll go to Nan S and then uh, Benjamin afterwards. Hi, I'm Nan Smith, uh, 48 Chapel Street. Um, I want to address uh, Carmen as well. Uh, Carmen, I absolutely hear what you're saying. Um, although I've been listening um, to these meetings um, with the neighborhood um, all along, and I think I heard one person that really was someone that you are absolutely on the nose about. What we're doing here, and we're seeing more of this throughout the city, um, part of a group that's looking into zoning changes, trying to protect neighborhoods, working class, middle class, and affordable housing. Um, that I, And we are looking at all of these things. There's going to be a zone change um, at... Uh, well, I'm not sure if it's 3133 Chapel Street or 31 Prince Street coming up uh, at the planning board uh, and uh, legislative matters soon. And I hope all the same people will be there. And that's a business uh, that's putting office space and um, full uh, rent apartments in there. So uh, please don't feel that because we're you know picking this apart, this is something we want to see more of across the city, protecting all of us, including our new neighbors that will be living at 23 Laurel Street. There's been a lot of great changes that have been made by this group, and thanks to uh, Laura and our uh, counselor uh, Karen Foster for really putting this thing together. Thank you. Mr. Spencer. Hi. Thanks, um, Benjamin Spencer, I'm at 8 Rust Avenue. So um, just across the street from where this project is going in. And um, I think I, um, uh, I wasn't actually planning on saying anything, um, but um, in response to Carmen's statement, um, what I'm really excited about and really grateful for on the part of um, CDC and, and, and what we saw tonight, there's been a lot of um, community input uh, and a lot of community involvement um, with this project. And I think that a lot of good has come out of that. And I think a lot of it is gonna be good that will benefit the people living at this um, 
location. So I, I, I really, uh, and I really appreciated that one slide that kind of uh, bullet pointed all, all of the input and what's been changed and things like that. Um, I thought that was wonderful. It's great for that to be acknowledged. Um, and I think it really shows um, where, you know, community involvement can um, improve outcomes um, for everybody. And, 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 you know, being proactive and getting the neighborhood engaged um, in a timely fashion, I think is, is, is the results are, are being proven by this project. And so I, I'm, I'm proud of all of us for you know, being here tonight and taking the time and caring. And, um, and I think that's what I'd like to say. Thank you, Benjamin. And Barbara Dean. Hello, everybody. Um, I just uh, wanted to say, um, uh, reiterate on some of the subjects that everybody's all, already talked about, but just to say that um, my real concern at the beginning of this was that this was designed for funding and not for the neighborhood that we're in. And I want to just say, I truly appreciate all the changes that have been made, the remediation of the water, because we've all fixed our basements so many times. And I would really like to see it be a, a more of a part of the neighborhood as opposed to a separate entity and built for, um, uh, you know, uh, oh, sorry, I have a visitor. She's just, just gonna grab the store here. And uh, I do really appreciate all the um, effort to remediate the water and the lighting I think is a very important thing because when I'm when Cole Morgan came in we were told that there was going to be down lighting and there was no down lighting and it took quite a while for us to get down lighting same thing we were told that the plannings were going to be attractive and that they would really fit into the neighborhood and it took us quite a long time to get that remediate they weren't attractive and they didn't fit in with the neighborhood as we were promised so I just want to say to the city that I really appreciate it when um uh, there is a collaboration and when people follow through. In other words, if you're gonna tell us it's gonna be a certain way, then it is that way. That, that makes it a better relationship all the way around. And I, I welcome new neighbors. I just would like to keep it quiet and, and lovely. That's why, why I moved here. And that's why a lot of us like the street is, is the nature of the street. So I like, I like a lot of everything that all of you said, but I, and I do think lighting is important and I love the uh, changes for the water and also the solar. So thank you for working so hard and, and um, making this collaborative. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Barbara Jean. And uh, Councilor Foster. Hi, thanks. I also didn't uh, plan to say anything, but just wanted to reiterate the gratitude from the neighborhood for the collaboration and the process. Um, Valley CDC is really engaged with neighbors and as well as to, to thank the neighborhood for coming to the table with an open mind and working with Valley CDC. Um, you know, it's really been a, a collaborative process. And I, I did submit a letter ahead of time, um, you know, that, that I am in support of this um, permit application, but just wanted to, to take a moment to say that. And thank you to all of you for your time. Thank you. Well, we'll keep the uh, public comment period open for a little bit. We'll address the issues that came out about the uh, solar and the uh, electrical impact for that on the, on the system. And also we'll talk more about the lighting for sure. Um, so let's turn it back to the planning board for a minute. Any other questions about the design, the management, the structure? George, um, just to clarify about the, um, the lighting standards, we do have um, standards that we, the lighting has to be shielded. It's in, been in place for years. So it's not something we're working on and the board has discussed this and you've talked about this previously. So that th those have to be met unless the board waives those. Um, and of course, the other comment about the, um, you know, interior layout, that's completely um, a choice that Valley made to de describe the interior of the structure. So that's not something that's required in the zoning. So it's not scrutiny that the planning board plays that uses for evaluation, because you're really just looking at it, the exterior, of course. So I just wanted to clarify that for the public, that that is just the choice that Valley made to present everything 
um, down to the interior details of the layout. Thank you. Hey, George. George. Yes, Carmen. Okay, so I'm not going to start my video again because I think that you won't be able to hear me. But anyway, um, and I'll never ever use this device again for Zoom uh, meeting. But I appreciate everybody's comments. Um, everybody has a very valid point of view. Um, and I'm also learning as I go. So anyway, I just wanted to say that I appreciate people's comments. Thank you very much. Thanks, Carmen. Okay, planning board members, any technical questions before I launch into my laundry list? I had one question, maybe this was already addressed about the parking. Are the spaces allocated to units? I don't even know if that's something that we would even step into. I'm just wondering how that's planned. I was just thinking about the entrances to those units that are along the street and whether you know the, the people in those would have the spots near them or if it's just more laissez-faire. Do you want me to speak to that? Please. So it's a it's it's somewhere between laissez-faire and structured. Um, we typically will require tenants to show that they have ownership of a vehicle and it's registered in their name, and then they'll get a parking permit. And then it's first come, first serve. We don't designate certain spaces, but having the parking permit system means that it it limits who's parking on the site itself. Okay. okay. And just to stay on parking for a minute, I imagine there is on-street parking along Laurel Street on both sides of the street, or is there any signage that dictates how parking is handled on the street if there is overflow? So Laurel Street has no parking restrictions on either side. Um, we genuinely believe we're providing enough off-street parking. Um, I know there's concern that the street might get filled with cars. Um, we don't anticipate that at all. Um, we have pointed out a couple of times that Laurel Street is a cut through, people go fast, um, and that having a few cars um, parked on the street might actually help with that situation. It's one of the best traffic calming measures. So just throw that out there. Okay. And I didn't see it on the plan, but I assume there's a few designated spaces for handicapped parking. Correct. Okay. And how about an electrical vehicle charging station? Most likely. Either well, We will either, I mean, basically the way things are trending, we will either provision for it, meaning run the conduit and be set up for it, or actually install one dual head charger on the site. I, I think we may have passed an ordinance lately that any parking lot of more than 50, and I'm not clear, I might need Carolyn to weigh in here. Any parking lot, a new parking lot of more than 15 spaces needs to have at least one dual EV station installed. Carolyn, can you help me there? Yes. Um, so I will. You also have the ability to waive that, of course, under site plan, but I will get you the figure is actually. Um, um, for every. Um, and you just you debated it for so long, we should all know this. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, yeah, why don't you go on if there are okay. other comments, because right. it's, it's not popping up here. I wonder if it's not been codified yet. Let me just Good. find it. Okay. Just because we, we, we know that it's a growing movement in our country and in the region of more electric cars, and um, people may not have the option like other homes of plugging into an outdoor outlet or renovating their own electrical system to provide that charging. So it would be great to do it up front. Right. Um, there was a little uh, notation about the, the fencing, a cedar fenching along one side that was going to be six feet on another side that was eight feet. Yes. That, that'll all be noted on the submitted plans, which is which, and I don't know what the backside was going to be uh, towards L3, if there was going to be a fence there also. 
I don't believe there's a fence in the back. L3 does have its own fence in that location. And they also have a pretty uh, lush, well-grown uh, vegetative screen. And then we are also doing plantings. Correct me if I'm wrong, Rachel. That's correct. The, and L, L3's fence is an eight foot high chain link fence. With a, is, a scrim, is there a scrim on it? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. There, there is. There yeah, I is. thought there yep. was a scrim on it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Homeland Security. So can I clear? I, I didn't um, actually see that, Laura, that the some sections of fence are eight feet that yep. you're proposing. Yeah. Because in the residential district, typically the maximum is six feet. Yeah. Um, without a zoning board permit. So is that what your intention was to go to the DBA for that? Uh, well, it was, it was requested by the neighbor and we said we would ask you folks for permission to do it. We have not made a commitment, I don't think, to do a separate permitting process for a taller fence. And are you saying the planning board cannot permit a taller fence under 40 Correct hour? it. Um, so there are, it's not, um, 40 R covers the use and the dimensions, not necessarily all the details. It doesn't allow, it's not a waiver system okay. for all the other zoning. Right. So it would be a zoning board of appeals special permit separately for the fence. Okay. So I assume then if you do permit this, you'll just specify that it has to be six feet and we will negotiate with that neighbor offline about that issue. Sounds like a good compromise for tonight. Um, so just a moment on the question that came up about the electrical infrastructure. I imagine all the uh, electrical feeds to these units will be underground. Yes. Um, and they take into consideration in the engineering, the impact of solar panels and how that connects to the grid. So there shouldn't be any issue about what's available on the street from um, our, our utility company. So we will get a will serve letter from the utility company. It, it, this is a, a moving target, honestly, because the <clears throat> grid is becoming more and more stressed. I don't anticipate having trouble getting enough power for this development because it's relatively small. Um, their ability to receive and how much energy they can receive back from us from solar, I think is what Anthony was talking about. And we, we have not established that yet. Interesting, thank you. Other questions from the panel the, board? Are the solar panels, I don't know if you've gotten into this yet, but are, they, are the panels do the powers go to the units that they're on top of, or is it central? It's central and then. Yeah, it's, one, it's, it's an individual yeah. meter or do each unit have a meter. It could go either way. We tend we tend to try to do one meter. We pay all the utilities as the landlord. It's part of rent. Um, there is a new incentive program in Massachusetts for all electric that requires you to separately meter buildings. So I can't definitively say whether it's enough money to entice us to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, we're paying all the utilities and we are collecting savings from the PV panels to offset those utilities that the tenants are using. Okay. Because it seemed like there were a couple of units where like a bedroom of one unit was on top of someone else's living bathroom or something. So right. I just don't know how right. you figure that out. Yeah. But that's, that's no. seems it's like a better be, way to deal with it. Yeah. Money in, money out. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, related to the lighting, can we talk about the pavilion for a minute? Yes. Um, we assume that that's going to be used for gatherings of uh, the families or whatever, and there is a talk about having lighting certainly within the pavilion and perhaps yeah. having some kind of cut off at a certain time of night. So a comment came to that we should plan for a timer. Um, for that pavilion lighting. And I, I don't know, maybe also for the bike area so that those lights are just automatically shutting off at a certain time of night. Um, the lights that are on folks' porches are going to be shielded. 
Um, and if you could see the numbers on the photometric plan, which are teeny, um, you would see that the standards that Northampton has are very, um, really, 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 really limit how much light. It's going to be a very dim light. And it's it basically goes to zero light about five feet away from the light so that there shouldn't be any spill off of the property whatsoever from those porch lights. Um, it, it should be pretty dim overall. Instead of a timer for such a thing that you really would do something that's motion, some sort of motion sensitive. I'm not sure why a pavilion would have a, I mean, if someone wants to hang out at the pavilion and hang out, it's, they're, they're renting a space. Uh, uh, that was the note that came actually via the, the planning board that we would want a timer there. So maybe we should talk about that. So it's, you can have quite complex controls. You can, you can have uh, motion and timer and one can be dominant so that you, the motion works only at certain times and then the timer would turn everything off and regardless, lights would not come on. Love it. The controls are pretty, pretty flexible. But I think the comment is, wouldn't we want people to be able to turn the lights on in the pavilion yeah. late at night? And that's, I don't object to that. I guess I'm looking to the planning board for guidance. That's the point of lights, isn't it? To use it when it's dark outside. Yeah. Uh, I, I think this gets to what we were talking about earlier, the kind of paternalism. Honestly, it has to, more to do with multifamily versus single family more than who, you know, the affordability issue. Um, and I, I agree with I, what I think Sam's saying is that, yeah, let's use lights at night when it's dark, not in the daytime. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as long as long as they are, you know, not uh, being directed into, you know, someone's, you know, uh, house. Right. You know. So the pavilion will have a gable shape. Lighting will be up yeah. within that gable. And so I think it won't be hard to just have it downcast in a very small area right around the pavilion. Okay, so it sounds to me like we're not asking for any kind of controller um, on those lights, that there will actually be some kind of manual on and off switch um, to be used by anyone. Does that go for the bike rack, the bike area also? Um, again, in, in many situations we have asked for um, some kind of limit about the nighttime lighting up of large areas? The, they also can be dimmable so that as the evening goes on, they're not as bright as they are initially in the evening um, to avoid light pollution um, and impacting you know, the insects and, and other animals nearby. One last thing, I can, the energy code requires that they are not able to be, outdoor lights are not able to be turned on during the day. So they will all have to have a photovoltaic control um, so that they are limited. They cannot be on during the day. If you switch them on, nothing would happen unless it's dark, basically. Okay, so again, the board members, I'm a little confused. Are we saying that uh, there will be no limitations on the lights in the pavilion or uh, along the, the bike parking area? I guess I took from what Tom uh, said that we can almost have our cake and eat it too, that you know, it can be timed and motion sensitive at the same time. So no one actually has to turn it off. So you're saying it, suggesting it's time say to go off at 9 p.m. But if someone enters the pavilion at 11 yeah. p.m. It, it would go on yeah. for them. I think exactly. that's possible, right Tom? Yeah, we can do that. Huh. Okay, Tom, that's a tricky one. And then if people are just sitting there playing cards, the lights are gonna go off on them. 
um, to keep bidding. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> the problem with motion detectors. And right. yeah, and yeah. you have to get the hierarchy of who, which control is controlling right. who properly, which is can be tricky. We have to do oh. that in the city hall all the time. Yeah, I have to do that in my office. It's just, you got to get up and you know move around a little bit. You don't want to sit there too long. Yeah, it's good for the good for the body. Good. Okay. All right. We have a funny consensus then. Um, um, I could get back to you on the um, conduit. It's actually you remember half of the equation, George, um, for parking spaces over 25 you need charging ports for one on a basis of one per 15 basis <laughs> so um they think they're showing 22 if i'm not mistaken and that um, 20 we have 20 parking spaces oh 20 and that's um uh, yeah so. at a minimum i will just tell you as as developers at a minimum we'll provision for the installation of one. We don't know yet how many of our affordable housing tenants will end up as electric vehicle owners and when. We don't know the answer to that. Many of them don't have cars at all, um, but we want a provision for it and we may in fact end up installing one dual, dual station. Thank you. If, if you could, again, can I ask what? a question? Um, it seems like a, a cool development. What What are you doing? You know, as you know, things get drier and drier. What is What are your thoughts on anything other than just grass for this development? I mean, you can't you can't yeah. water I'll, lawns anymore. Right. I'll I'll let Rachel talk about that. And um, we've limited the lawn areas on site. Um, the site plan is, is predominantly um, shrubs and ground covers and trees um, and drought, 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 um, drought adapted plantings. We've also changed the areas that we do have on. We've changed the seed blend. Um, it used to see more seed blends with bluegrass, which is a water, a water lover, uh, loves the sun, loves the water. Um, but we switched to a seed mix that um, uses tall fescue, which you can cut at the same height as the grass and sports fields, but it's more drought tolerant. So that's something that, um, and we do have we do have a little bit of blue, like ten percent blue grass in there also, but it looks it looks like a traditional lawn, but it's a lot more drought tolerant. Um, and I, I do think going to um, planting beds and the shade and ground cover and Building up that organic content in the soil really helps retain moisture long term. So the site happens to have quite high groundwater. Um, yes. <laughs> so we've been more focused on having too much water, but it's a good question. Okay, good. So just back to Letty for a minute. My understanding is then that a new lighting plan stamp yes it's going to be submitted yes. that'll note the different yes okay thank you very much um i think we've pretty much answered all the questions from the public that hadn't previously been answered by the applicant um but if anyone would like a last chance to speak regarding the application before we move to perhaps close the public comment period please raise your hand or Okay. Thank you, Sam. The motion has been made to close public comment. Is there a second? I second. All right. Um, again, once we close the public comment, we won't be able to ask the applicant any questions. Do, do the board members have any final questions for the applicant? Or we'll just go to our own discussion. All right. The motion has been made and seconded. Um, why don't we start with Chris? Yes. All right. And Jana? Yes. David? Yep. And Melissa? Yes. And uh, the chair also votes yes. So it's unanimous. The public comment period is closed. 
So back to the board, any discussion about the plan, last comments? We'll go over the few conditions that we have before motion's made. I I like the, I really, the, the project is great. I, I would like to, to see, um, uh, to see some um, money put put aside for you know maybe like a year after it's fully uh, after it's fully um, in use uh, to make sure that um, like if there's parking that needs to be added that uh, that that's um, that that works um, but I, I don't need to I'm not. That's, that's not a cross I need to I need to die on. <laughs> I would say um yeah, I think this is a great project. The scale is nice. I think the there's kind of a nice attention to the individual experience of people living in each unit, uh, having like a, a nice different character and it's um you know, it's a townhouse development with a parking lot, but it doesn't feel like a townhouse, like in a sea of parking, which is really nice. I actually, I'm a little worried the lighting analysis, uh, in a sense, like looks too good to me, uh, in a sense that I feel like it's going to be really, really, really dark uh, for people who park at 6.30 p.m. in January. It's a getting a zero, <laughs> you know, and that seems, I don't know, that's way darker than any, uh, owner of a single family home would have it in their driveway. Um, and I think there's a safety issue and I would hope maybe it should be addressed in a revision and not wait for some kind of horrible event to happen. Um, but otherwise I think this is a great, a great project. Anyone else? Just right. on, on the parking, um, if there is a need for extra parking, Carolyn or George, please correct me if I'm wrong, but for abutters who are still here who might have concerns about that, I think that the place, if you're feeling like there isn't sufficient parking on the site, is the place to direct those concerns, Councillor Foster or to Valley CDC. Carolyn, maybe you can speak to that, just where people would bring that, that issue if it if it is indeed an issue. Um, I, yeah, sure, I can answer that. So first of all, there, the um, parking ratio is, is one space per um, unit for the units that are a thousand square feet or smaller. So the three bedroom units um, and possibly, and the two bedroom units, I guess, would be above that threshold. So the standard would could be up to two parking spaces for those number of units. <clears throat> um, and um, so I think the, um, I guess the, the planning board is really evaluating uh, the grant of a reduction in parking below the total number. Um, and I have to pull up the plans again. I think it would be um, maybe six more spaces. Um, or is it the total, I think maybe in that um, overflow area, but I guess the, um, it would not be, a, it's not a city councilor issue. It would be either, it would be a potentially in a, um, it would come back, I think, through the building department. It's one of those things that's gonna be a little bit gray because the planning board approves it knowing that there could be um, an issue, um, addressed with this extra sort of um, grass area that could be converted to parking. Uh, I believe that that would really just be essentially a voluntary one because the board has made a decision to reduce the parking requirement. Um, unless the board writes into it, you know, there could be a permit condition that says, um, after, you know, after five years of occupancy, the Valley CDC shall submit um, an evaluation of parking on site. And if there are um, parking, if they're issuing parking passes um, at capacity at 20, then they need to build 
the new parking spots or something like that. Or you could do some other time frame. But, you know, I, I think I would, in order for there be, in order for Valley to be compelled to go ahead and build out those extra spaces, there has to be a trigger. Um, and, and it wouldn't just be a conversation with the building commissioner. Um, because the planning board would have granted the waiver. We can't we can't like endow the planning staff with the discretion to enforce you know a future for if they deem it necessary. Um, no, I think that's too much discretion and um, based on previous legal counsel, because this is a board decision, you, you can't assign away a discretionary analysis to an administrative staff unless there's a specific, you know, no. So let's say after, um, you know, if Valley, you know, the other thing you could put in is a condition. if. Um, at the at a time as such that Valley issues twenty uh, parking placards for their residents, that is the trigger for them to build the four extra spaces. You could do it that way. So if they never get to the point where they've issued all of their parking passes to residents, then there's no need to build. But at the point at which they do that, then they need to build it, and that's probably the best way to do it. I guess. Right, since they do yeah. have a system. Yeah. Could we, could we add to something like like that where you if they have twenty if they have twenty or more placards for I don't know a year, um, then at that point they have to build because it seems like they sure. could hit twenty and then in you know, people it's a rent place of so people come and go. Uh, yeah. So, you know, forcing them to build for four because they hit 20 once doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah, that, that could work too. But, you know, I, I would want to take a different tact. I mean, I, I trust Valley's, whether it's anecdotal data or whatnot, but by and large in developments like this, um, parking is not maximized. It's more of 0.5 per unit rather than 1.5 or 1. And also there is a city street right outside here that allows for parking, um, which we all deal with. When I have friends over, they park on the street. I don't have room for more than one car on my driveway. Um, why would we wanna treat this so much differently? If Valley finds that it's a real operational problem and they start hearing from neighbors about that, I trust that then they would extend into that new parking area. But I, I would want to say that there's sufficient parking there. We want to do this in more and more neighborhoods, not add additional parking, because you add additional parking and more people come and drive cars. Let's try to encourage public transportation and walking. And, you know, the bus stop is nearby. Uh, Valley Bike is right around the corner. I, I'd rather not encourage, kind of promote more parking. I think that's what we're saying is that we're not making them do it at this point. It would be only if it turns out that they are using more than they expect. Yeah, that's, that's right. I'm not saying that they have to build for. In fact, I'm saying that if they have 20 and over, and if if they have 20 for a year's time, whatever that number winds up being, at that point, then they need to build uh, build. Uh, those four, those four parking, four, four parking spaces. Yeah, I mean, I think where my question was coming from was not necessarily that I want them to go ahead and build the extra four. On balance, George, I agree with you that discouraging car ownership and putting in fewer parking spaces where there's data to support that they aren't needed is a good thing. I think, but I also want to make sure that since. Valley CDC has made the effort to make this space available and to run their calculations accordingly. I think the sort of full circle of that gesture is that if, the, if there is actually a sustained concern that the neighbors and abutters know what to do about that. And it sounds like either we can put in a formal trigger and a, a condition 
that requires the parking spaces under a certain condition, or we're relying on Valley CDC to sort of in good faith hold up their end of the bargain. And if they get concerns to kind of make a judgment about when you know enough is enough and they need to put in those extra things. So it sounds to me like as a board, we need to just decide whether we want to condition it or leave it up to Valley CDC and um, have the neighbors negotiate directly with them. Right, we don't want to get into a situation where, I mean, Valley CDC is not this, but we want to be fair to like, be neutral to the reputation of the of the applicant. But like, we don't want to get into a situation where there's a bunch of complaints and we have no mechanism for triggering the, like, the additional spaces to be built if there is an issue. So really, what's happened is uh valley has kind of sat them and sat themselves in the foot by offering this new space if they had just gone through with their 20 spaces everything would have been hunky dory but now that they've offered this option we're kind of forcing them to use it All no right. i don't, I don't um, think so well we're forcing them to use it. Well, like they they are creating they've created what should be the norm which is good plan, which it says you know, I mean, in my mind, we okay places that don't have enough parking. Um, and, uh, you know, but, I think this is. Um, okay, so let, let's state this condition again. At the time that Valley issues 20 parking passes in one calendar year, then they will proceed to install four more parking spaces in the allotted lawn. Is that what I'm hearing? I, I threw out a year because I just threw out a year. I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, maybe a year and a, a year and a half, given that, you know, if everyone signs, if, if you, you know, sign a year lease, uh, you would want to allow for that you know, for things to, um, you know, I mean, not, obviously not everyone is gonna sign their lease at the same time, but theoretically, if that were to happen, you'd want to allow for more than a year to, to be okay with any turnover that does happen or changes. And I, as a renter, would grab one of those um, parking passes, regardless of whether I have a car or not. So I guess I have to give them a registration and show them a proof of ID or whatever in order to get the pass. So again, it gets to be a little cumbersome for Valley, but. But that, but that mechanism was in place anyways. They, they have a system where the only people who get parking passes are people who own a house there or, or rent, rent a house there and own, a, own their car or lease their car or whatever they do with their car. So, but let me just make sure I understand. So you're suggesting that um, if Valley um, has um, parking passes distributed to for 20 cars over um, yes. consistently over an 18 month period, then um, that will be the trigger to build out the remaining um, parking spaces on the site. Is that what you're suggesting? That's what I was suggesting. And, you know, honestly, it's, it's good data for us to have, you know, like I, you know, I've always sort of not like believe the data of, um, you know, uh, low income people not having more parts, uh, but I love to be proved wrong. And it's data is great data. Yeah, I would imagine if they were if they were if they were giving out all the parking permits and they still had vacant units, I would imagine they, like any other property owner, would want to have a little more parking to serve their tenants. So, yeah, I don't think we're. I think we're, it's a. I think we're all on the same. Uh, we all have the same goal here. Um, I just want to also point out for people who, you know, who are qualifying for affordable housing. You know, we all love the bus system, I'm sure, but not having good transportation to get to work is a huge hardship. Um, so the reality is we live in a place where you need to get around, so. 
Um, I, I also have a question. I don't know if this is outside of the realm of this permit, but when I went to visit the site, I was quite confused as to whether parking is allowed on the street or not. It doesn't seem like it should be. It's pretty narrow, um, but it does seem like the right of way is bigger than the actual paved uh, um, street. So I, I don't know if that's something that's a DPW decision. I don't know. I like how that works. One hundred percent. When I when I went there uh, uh, today, now granted I had this big truck, but I I literally felt like I was parking in the middle of the street. Right. Um, and uh, um, and so did the person who honked at me when. That <laughs> was me. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's good. As was mentioned, that's a perfect traffic calming situation. Yep. Just like Market Street, where you pass through every day, Sam. <laughs> Okie doke. So I've heard that condition about uh, 20 parking spaces in an 18 month span. I think Carolyn has the language there. Um, I'm sorry that uh, we closed the public hearing before we got into that so we could get a little feedback from the applicant, but I think they've listened to it and heard it. And uh, um, that's what the board has decided. Um, there really aren't, if we could just talk about the other conditions, um, you know, the other condition is that a new lighting plan will be submitted uh, to the planning office, um, which will contain some information regarding the uh, controlling of the pavilion lights and the, uh, the bicycle parking lights. Um, prior to site work, tree protection shall be installed or shown on the plan. Um, Carolyn, you mentioned about DPW in our previous permit about um, siltation devices being installed around the perimeter of the work zone. Does that apply to this um, application? They have a separate stormwater permit. So they have all these conditions under from DPW related to the stormwater permit. Okay. All right. And that permit it also involves a maintenance plan for that underground filtration system. Okie doke. I have I missed any other conditions, board members? Carolyn? So they're um just checking. Um no. Um Sam, Sam Sam had mentioned a few times the idea of like holding money for um for the parking thing or something. I don't think that's feasible or I don't even know how you I mean it sounds like the project's not even gonna happen for two years so if anyone knows how much money to hold for a construction project in 2025 uh go find a great job cost estimating but um so I, I think that's I hope that's okay that we can't uh yeah that is, I, I feel like they they've already they mentioned that they had plenty of or uh, plenty is um, not the right word but they had money uh for capital improvement so and they're, they're a trusted organization in our in our community. So. And also, maybe the condition sort of covers for that, so um, they would be obligated to meet that condition. Um, I, there was the other um, about the lighting in the pavilion being on a photo cell, um, and then motion sensor after nine or something like that. Um, that I thought hurt. I wasn't sure if there was consensus on the board about that one. I believe there was. Does anyone want to speak to that? That everybody's fine with the card players jumping up and down and turn the lights on again. Nine o'clock is a good time if that's available. Yep. Um, I noticed that Barbara Jean has raised her hand again. I, I apologize, Barbara Jean, but for this hearing, we closed the public comment period. If you have a specific question, I'm sure you can get in touch with Carolyn um, by email or phone call, but we really can't take any other comments at this point. Sorry about that. All right. If there are no other questions, we seem to have run through this application. Is there a motion?
Uh, I'll move that we approve the uh, 20 new units at 23 Laurel, Laurel Street um, with the conditions of uh, tree protection prior to the work, uh, the resubmission of the lighting plan as described, uh, motion sensors, and uh, what are we calling them? Solar sensors? Yep. Photo, sensors, photo sensors and motion sensors on the pavilion lights and uh, the requirement that the uh, proposed additional parking spots uh, be implemented after 18 months of uh, 20 permit parking permits being issued. Great. I do we, that right? <laughs> we won't ask you to repeat that, but that's good. <laughs> Motion has been made. Is there a second? Okay. okay, seconded by Sam. Any discussion? All right, I just, I want to thank the neighbors who are still here for engaging in this 18-month uh, discussion with Valley CDC and Valley CDC for um, having that, you know, really good dialogue with folks. Um, I heard some really great comments about accepting this. Um, this development in the neighborhood as opposed to other uh, applications that we've been through in the past two years um, and really appreciate the work that everyone's done and really look forward to adding this to uh, Northampton's inventory of housing. Um, I hope the funding works and we see it in two, 2024. All right, so the motion's been made, seconded, no discussion. We'll go to a voice vote. We'll start with Chris. Yes. And Jenna. Yes. Sam. And Melissa. Yes. David. Yep. All right. And the chair makes it unanimous. So thank you very much, everyone. Carolyn, I don't think we have any ANRs or anything else to deal with. No. Yeah, we did it during the break. <laughs> okay, and just just on our schedule next month, we're meeting on the September eighth. Is it September eighth? Right, At and time. there are there are hearings. Um, there are a couple of items coming through from zoning for zoning amendments, but you're but no joint public hearings um, for these. Okay. And I may not be available, so Jenna, get your chair person hat on. So that's in person? <laughs> in person at council yes. chambers. In person, yes. Okay. So, so a motion to adjourn at 9.30? Do so we, moved. Before we do that, is there another planning board in September or just the 8th? No, there's two. Um, so it would be the 8th and the 22nd. Right. And that's in person as well? Yes. So basically, we're going back to two meetings a month, the 2nd and the 4th. And they'll all be in person for us, although Carolyn is going to set up with her IT helpers um, uh, kind of a hybrid setting where people will be able to watch and listen to us, but they won't be able to engage other than comments they've made earlier to Carolyn by email or telephone call. And so we're typically, the, the is it the second and the fourth? Mm -hmm. Correct, Thursday? Yep. Yeah. Good. Any other uh, quick ideas? Someone, someone made a motion that I will second to adjourn. All right, motion made by Jen and seconded by David. Any discussion? Anybody want to hang out? <laughs> All right. Okay, we'll go to a voice vote. Melissa, let's start with you. Yes. Chris? Yes. Jenna? Yes. And Sam? And David? Yes. yes. Okay, George says yes too. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Night. <laughs>